Uh, I don't want to take too much time because uh, time is very precious and we have four excellent scholars which are eager to share with us their knowledge and eager to answer all the comments and questions the participants have. I would only like to thank them very much. Uh, Neil, is, uh, Neil Brenner is currently in Singapore, so for him it's uh, after dinner in the evening. And uh, so thank you for this special opportunity you gave us. And uh, Christian is in Switzerland. I think you are in Zurich currently. Yes, yes. So it's quite a complex combination. And I'm very happy we were able to arrange that. So thank you very much. And the floor is yours for the introduction, Neil. OK, so uh, I assume everyone can hear me. Um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. It's 9 PM here in Singapore, so um, late at night. But I've been asked to um, just say a few remarks about um, this article. And we assume everyone has read it, but um, I'll just say a few things about what we what we argued, why we argued it, and how it fits into our broader project. And then Christian will add some remarks, and then we can open this up. I mean, basically, um, you know, a couple of things by way of introduction. I mean, the first is that um, it's it's an interesting moment in the field of urban studies because urban questions are increasingly on the global agenda with regard to a whole range of global issues self-viewed as central to the future of the world economy, the future of social life, the fitness and citizenship, and the future of our kind of global environment. So it's an interesting moment where urban questions are not just on the agenda for urbanists like ourselves, but are really on the agenda of kind of Global global debates, and so, so it's an exciting moment. But at the same time, and this is where a lot of the work John and I are doing is um, an attempt to make an intervention. Um, there's a lot of confusion about how we understand the nature of the urban and its relationship to broader economic, political, environmental trends. And so there, there are a lot of, um, in our terms, urban ideologies. So different public discourses um, connected to different political strategies in these in economies and societies and environments, um, which um, oftentimes rest upon very problematic foundations. And there are a whole range of different global urban ideologies. So in other words, discourses that some aspect of city life to broader global concerns. Um, and one of those particular discourses is, we argue in this article, the urban age discourse. There are many different variations of the urban age discourse. But at core, the urban age discourse is the proposition that we live in an urban age because more than 50% of the world's population allegedly now lives within cities. So Chris John and I are engaged in investigation of planetary urbanization. Um, we're trying to make sense of contemporary spatial transformations in a variety of different sites around the world, which hopefully we can talk about a little bit in this conversation. And in the context of that work, we've really found um, a number of the dominant approaches to urban studies, including uh, many of the dominant global urban ideologies, to be very misleading um, and ineffectual bases for thinking about the changes that we're seeing all, uh, going on around us all over the world. So this paper is part of a broader attempt to critically interrogate the conceptual and epistemological foundations which um, we use in order to think about and influence urban questions. So it's one engagement with a particularly influential global urban ideology but it's also part of an attempt to develop an alternative way of thinking about our global urban condition. So specifically with regard to the urban age proposition, um, what we do in the article, as you know from reading it, is we, um, we basically suggest that it's a thoroughly misleading basis for understanding our global urban condition. We do believe that urban questions are fundamental to the world that we live in, to the nature of contemporary capitalism, but we try to argue in the article 
that defining that situation with reference to the proposition that 50% of the world's population now lives within cities is a very inadequate basis for doing that. So we spend some time in the article reconstructing the history of attempts to measure the world's urban population, going back to Kingsley Davis, up through a variety of attempts um, within the United Nations and other international organizations to measure urban populations, all the way up to present discourses about the supposed transition beyond the 50% threshold that we've just made. There are a range of empirical problems, as we um, explain, with attempts to measure the world's urban population. The problem, of course, is how do you differentiate the city from the non-city? And there are a range of different um, radically incompatible criteria that are being used by the United Nations in its 50%, its claim about the 50% population threshold. Different countries use completely different criteria, different population thresholds, different population density thresholds, and other criteria for determining their urban population. That's a problem which has existed since Kingsley Davis first tried to measure the world's urban population back in the 1950s. It remains totally unresolved. But more importantly for our concerns in this article and within the broader project of which the article is a part, is that the notion of the urban age that's been popularized within this United Nations discourse is thoroughly chaotic. In other words, the nature of that urban condition that is supposedly demarcated by the populations of cities is um, thoroughly uninterrogated. And we spent some time in the latter part of the article unpacking some of the theoretical assumptions that underpin the declaration of the urban age, the notion of the city as a bounded settlement type, the embrace of a kind of ontology of the urban versus the rural. So in other words, in classifying spatial organization, you have two choices, either urban or rural. And finally, the notion of a basically a, a distributional model of the threshold that we've supposedly crossed with the urban age. So the idea that it's basically population flowing from a static ahistorical rural zone to an equally static ahistorical urban zone. It's just sort of flowing from one to the other and we now have more people living in the urban side of that um, equation. So we have a lot of problems with that, which we unpack in the article. And then finally, in the very end of the article, we outline a few propositions for reconceptualizing our contemporary age of urbanization. So we think of it less as an urban age defined in terms of city building um, in itself, but rather the relationship between city building, which we continue to think is fundamental, in a whole range of transformations that are occurring outside of the big agglomerations, which are also fundamentally contributing to the contemporary formation of urbanization. Um, so we outline a few propositions at the end of the article, which in some of our more recent work, including a, a newly published article in the journal City, we elaborate in much greater detail. That article is called Towards a New Epistemology of the Urban, and we elaborate some of those ideas in more detail, and they're very much part of our ongoing project on planetary urbanization. So that's a, an attempt to quickly summarize a fairly wide-ranging um, paper, um, issues related to the critique of ideology, but also using that critique of ideology, as it were, as a springboard into developing an alternative interpretation, theoretically reflexive, um, uh, of our contemporary um, planetary urban condition. Christian, would you like to correct or complete uh, <laughs> that attempt to summarize what we did in this paper? <laughs> well, <clears throat> yes, I could, yes, I could add maybe, maybe one point that, um, that I think is very important. And it is uh, because it was always put forward in, uh, in discussions. Um, so very often, um, one of the critique that came to, I mean, some of our talks or our papers was um, that, well, I mean, this is a very theoretical um, kind of debate that we are starting. And I think you have to insist in the fact that, um, let's say, the motivation for that debate is not at all theoretical. It is very practical and very empirical. So we came 
uh, to those problems with uh, this definition of what is urban, what is rural, what is the what what is the, the, the percentage of, of of urban population. I mean that comes directly from from some very very practical concerns um, and some very empirical observations, so that we in a certain way realize. And with this kind of old instruments that we have, and with this kind of old understanding, and especially with the understanding that the, that the city is a kind of a bounded settlement space that we can distinguish, and that there are two worlds. There is an urban world on the one hand side, and there's a rural world on the other, that with those kind of understandings, we are not able anymore to really address um, the, uh, let's say, planetary dimension of urbanization processes that are going on. So I think that's a key moment. So um, maybe we will come to those points later, but just to, to put it into the debate now, to say that, um, I mean, it's key to look on those seemingly two different worlds as one world. So there is a world that is folk that is dominated today by a, a wide variety of organization processes, and we see those processes in the mega cities on the one hand, but we also see those processes um, in seemingly rural areas or in seemingly, um, let's say, um, nature areas or pristine areas or whatever, wilderness areas, they are all in one way or, or another shaped by urbanization processes. And so it's key to focus on those urbanization processes and not on, um, let's say, units that are at the end very arbitrarily defined. And with that perspective, we also look in different ways to both, let's say, both parts of that divide. So we look on the one hand side differently on the, let's say, rural part of the divide in, in, uh, in brackets, um, but we also look differently on the, let's say, urban parts of this divide. So uh, analyzing, let's say, what you did, uh, Neil, um, the, the, the extreme territories like the Sahara or, or the oceans or Mount Everest, um, this is one aspect of of that, I would say, new perspective that we have on the urban question. But at the same time, it is it has also affects how we how we analyze, let's say, these huge conurbations and so-called mega cities uh, as Tokyo or the Puerto Rico Delta or, or Lagos. Um, this also means that we analyze those areas in a different way. And I think that's the strength uh, and the power of that of that uh, of that new perspective that we try to and um, to um, develop here. I totally agree. Well said, Christian. <laughs> um, so our participants can uh, interact now. They can raise their hands and they can uh, pose uh, a question to your article. Um, why do they do that? I, I was thinking that it's also very related to what you say to the, to the definition of city that uh, you do when you speak about uh, urbanization or, or globalization of the urbanization. Because uh, uh, basically, uh, when you enlarge so much the uh, definition of city in order to include any kind of urban urbanization it's not the city that grows it's the urbanization that grows and uh, this means that uh, the characteristics which define the city as such uh, don't apply anymore may I, say, about that? Yeah, may, may, may I just answer to that please Okay, look, the point is that, and that's um, of course a part of our seven epistemological thesis that we developed. Um, we have to be we have to be very clear that the term city um, is a very is is a is a term that that was never clearly defined, and there is never, let's say, a unitary 
um, definition or understanding of what a city is or also what urbanization is. I think that's very, very important. If you go through the history of urban studies, uh, we see that we have a whole range of definitions and many of them are ex excluding themselves. Um, so, so, it's, so, so many of them are not compatible actually with each other. So that's the first point. Now, um, if we go on, a, on, a, on, on, on our track, on the way of um, to understand urbanization, uh, of course, we are following, let's say, certain traditions. And in that respect, we are mainly following a tradition that is developed by, of course, Henri Lefebvre and David Harvey. Um, and both of them understood urbanization as, a, as an encompassing process. As a, uh, Henri Lefebvre said, urbanization is a kind of a total phenomenon, a phenomenon that, is, that includes uh, a wide variety of aspects that we have to, um, that, that we have to take into consideration. Um, David Harvey um, said urbanization is not a question of city growth or something like that, but urbanization is, in a certain way, the process of the production of the built environment and its consequences for the process of circulation and reproduction of capital itself. So this is both understandings are a very general understanding. And um, so, so here the question is not, are we looking on some kinds of entities like cities or are we looking at some, let's say, um, let's say the, the growth of, of certain kinds of population. No, here the, 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 pro, uh, the, the let's say the focus is, is much broader and it is a process uh, that accompanies the industrialization of capitalist um, society. And so it is a, it's a key uh, moment of the development of those capitalist societies. And so of course we can see elements of urbanization um, in big cities, of course, but we can also see them in seemingly quite remote areas. So the point here is not to say that urbanization becomes uh, like an equivalent to capitalism or like an equivalent to, um, let's say, the, the, a worldwide um, uh, industrial development, um, but to define it much more precisely as one aspect of that development. Yeah, if I, I see there are questions coming, but maybe just quickly to add to what Christian said, because this is so this is such a fundamental question for our work. So so just synthesizing some of these points. So for us, number one, the emphasis is on processes, not units. And we're hardly original in making that emphasis. Lefebvre, Harvey, Doreen Massey, so many others make that point, but we haven't adequately drawn the consequences of that proposition. We still tend to describe the world of urban studies in terms of units. And if we look around at urban studies journals, including IGER, so many articles, they focus on processes, but they often define their objects with reference to particular units. So we're really trying to push this process-based framework. So that's one. Two, and again, just reinforcing what Christian already said, we really believe that the concept of city is used in a very chaotic way. There are many different formations and conditions of agglomeration, of clustering in the world. And we need a much more differentiated, historically, geographically specific vocabulary for deciphering the condition of agglomeration instead of just assuming that it's the same because we see these entities that we call cities all around the world. So that's, that's a proposition that maybe we can unpack in more detail. Um, sometimes our framework has been characterized as totalizing, which for us is a little bit perplexing because, if anything, the generalization of the notion of the city um, within our field to apply to so many different conditions seems like quite totalizing, and we're precisely resisting that and trying to develop a more contextually applicable vocabulary. So if anything, it's intended to be the opposite of totalizing. So that's two. And third, Again, just really reinforcing what Christian has already said, we, we insist that the urban condition cannot simply be circumscribed within the bounded unit of the city or the agglomeration. There are a whole range of morphological conditions, 
socio-spatial environmental transformations um, which support city building all around the world or agglomeration all around the world which we need increasingly to include within our investigation of urbanization processes. So towards the end of the article we introduce a distinction which is really central to our work between concentrated and extended urbanization which is um, one of the conceptual we think innovations which flows from the critique of the urban age that we try to develop in this article. Okay, then uh, thank you very much. I, I don't want to uh, uh, take out uh, uh, time from our participants. There is now uh, Sara Linama, which uh, would like to intervene. Now I'm opening her microphone so she can uh, pose a question orally. Sara, can you, can you speak? Yep, hello everyone. Hi. Hello. Great. Um, so thank you so much for this opportunity to discuss this article. Now, as someone who initially started in art history, not widely regarded as an asset in the social science orientations of urban studies, I have been following these urban reevaluations with interest because of its attention to issues of representation. So this is just a comment and then I'll lead to my question. Critical visual theory has something to add here, where this article makes a case for the mutually constituting relationship between urban research and its representation. You know, research creates this representation, repre representations start to inflect the research. Now, in your conclusion, you outlined guidelines that allow for, quote, heterodox engagements with the urban question. So part of my research pursues how critical artistic practices can share in this problem. And I'm just going to give a brief example here. So offshore, an interactive web documentary on deep sea oil drilling that takes place on an oil rig. Now the thing is, this deep sea oil rig is a fictional recreation because there's no such access for critical filmmakers to film a deep sea oil space. They weren't allowed. So they had to fictionally recreate it. Now the situation represents, the, to me, the reach of planetary urbanization to the depths of the ocean but without the recognizable markers of urban space, of access. So uh, with this representational challenge in mind, how do we meaningfully differentiate between the processes of extended urbanization and those of global capitalism, accumulation, and resource extraction? Yeah, great question. Um, Christian, do you want to um, take a stab? Well, yes. Um, I mean, that's that's precisely the point that um, that I mentioned at the beginning. And of course, this. I mean, we, we have to be careful because now we could we could we could go on for for hours to um, explain uh, this precise difference. But um, I think it's key to understand that. Um, I mean, we have like um, of course the process of global capitalism. We have also a process of industrialization, and um, I would, I mean, in that respect, we are following Henri Lefebvre, who uh, showed that on the backside of, or the flip side of, of industrialization is urbanization. Um, so both processes are close, closely related, but at the same time uh, different to each other. And so if we look on processes of urbanization in that context, uh, we focus on very specific aspects. And um, precisely in the aspect of extended urbanization, we are now, we, we are now developing a kind of, um, um, let's say, a kind of more precise concept, how we can grasp uh, those aspects. So we developed a kind of three-fold um, concept. So it has to do with, um, on the one hand side, um, metabolism. So how uh, raw materials and all, all sorts of resources and food and so on are produced and are linked to the urban population as one decisive moment. And the second decisive moment is um, the process of intensity. That means how how the land use is um, changing um, if um, an urbanization process is is going on in these areas. And the third aspect has to do with connectivity. 
so how certain areas are connected to other areas and of course in the core of those three elements or three aspects we have the process of the production of the built environment i think that's very important so this is the process of the production of material structures of buildings of infrastructures um, but that also includes of course aspects of how these uh, material structures and infrastructures are produced through which kind of political arrangements through which kinds of territorial um, regulations um, those um, aspects can be produced and finally um, the question of how the everyday life of the people that are living in those areas is changed through those processes so it is a relatively complex um, process but i would say in the core to make it easier to understand it in the core i would say it's the process of the production of the built environment that makes us understandable um, what urbanization means so urbanization always means um, so construction material changes in the world um, and and the production of new let's say um, spatial configurations this is still very abstract but just to give a kind of broad understanding um, of those kind of um, processes does that make some sense um if i may just add i just uploaded i hope everyone can see the slide is that visible to everyone the book cover can you guys see it is that a yes Yes. Okay. Thanks, everyone. I see you're writing yes. So um, I just wanted to briefly address the middle part of the question that was posed regarding visualization and counter visualization. So this is something that we think about a lot. So the latter part of your question, Christian has addressed with regard to the difference between kind of urbanization and capitalism in some of our categories. But the wind up to your question had to do with these, these questions about how you visualize the urban condition, particularly with regard to zones that are hard to access and we have to even imagine. And this is something, again, we could talk about all night. Like we, we think about this all the time because so much of urban ideology is expressed in a visual form. So I'm delighted to encounter an art historian who's interested in these questions. Um, just speaking for, for myself, I mean, Christian has been engaging with questions of, vis of visualization for quite some time, working very closely with architects. I'm a relative newcomer to that world following my move to a design school about three years ago. But um, just two quick points uh, or illustrations of the ways or some of the ways in which we're addressing these issues. So this is the cover of, um, of our book, Implosions, Explosions, which presents some of the intellectual foundations for this project. And it's precisely an attempt to destabilize the dominant visual ideologies that are associated with urban age discourse, which, of course, involve focusing on big cities, dense population centers. And this, I don't know if people recognize it or if you've, if you've read any part of the book, then maybe you know what, what this is an image of. But it's, it's, of course, the tar sands in northern Alberta, Canada, a zone of incredible environmental destruction um, associated with very large-scale industrial fossil fuel extraction. So exactly, tar sands. So for us, it's intended as a very strong provocation for our fellow urbanists that we view this condition as um, fundamental, as being as fundamental to the contemporary planetary urban condition in which we live as those of the big iconic dense vertical urban landscapes um, uh, that are normally focused upon in kind of urban discourse. So that's one. And let me just move on to a second one, which is it up? Yes, exactly. So this is a lot can be said about this, but it's just a quick illustration of some of the work that we're doing in the urban theory lab, which is it's connected to the example that was given about the um, oil platforms in the oceans. So part of that visual ideology that's connected to the urban age is that we think of the urban 
as a relatively confined condition, even if most people purportedly live within that condition. And then these big, dense mega cities are connected by lines, you know, by urban networks. And we think, you know, that's true, but that's only part of the picture because so much of the world is being transformed in relation to supporting those big mega cities, including places that, according to at least some cartographic representations of the world, look totally empty because they're relatively devoid of population. And one such example would be the major oceans of the world. So this is just one quick visualization by Matthew Brown, who's a GSD student and a contributor to the Urban Theory Lab of the Pacific Ocean. And I won't take up the time to go into the details of the visualization, but you can, you can immediately see from just looking at it that it's not empty at all. And that, and that part of what we're trying to say is that the representation of such spaces as empty is incredibly intellectually misleading and politically dangerous. So the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, is just one among any number of oceanic sites we could look at. It's filled with economic activity. It's filled with garbage. It's filled with shipping flows. It's filled with emergent forms of resource extraction as well as emergent speculations about possible future forms of resource extraction. This is only a, a representation of the surface. If you look at the subsurface and the volume, you open up all kinds of other perspectives about the operationalization of the oceans. So the oceans are part of the urban fabric. And that's, again, it's hardly a full or complete or, you know, as it were, empirically accurate representation of the real oceans. We're confronting the same problem that, um, that, the, that was outlined in the question with regard to how do you even access this space, um, which is controlled and controlled by all kinds of forces that are trying to essentially enclose it for purposes of private, um, uh, private, private appropriation. So that's a problem to which there's no simple solution, but to some degree through our counter visualization work, we can thematize that problem perhaps productively and destabilize some of the dominant ideologies that underpin the kind of mainstream visualizations of these, of these places and conditions around the world. Sarah, maybe you, you would like to, to reply to this, ask what something else? I'm opening your microphone now. Uh, thank you so much. That was actually very, very helpful. Um, I, and since I'm starting out, I'll let everyone else ask their questions, but maybe we can come back to it. And I will say that I do look forward to trying to work through some of these ideas through some of the kind of alternative practices that I study. I think there's some interesting points of resonance. Thank you. Thanks. Maybe, maybe maybe I could maybe I could add something to that, um, because I think one point that is quite decisive is that we have this kind of classical representations of the city, and um, so this is always some houses and uh, usually some 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 let's say houses from the uh, European cities from the either from the from somewhere from the from the late 17th, 18th century, or uh, than the classical skylines. So that's the usual way how cities are re represented. And um, I think that these representations are, in a certain way, forming the same trap as the definitions, uh, like the urban age definition. Um, so they, they are forming the same kind of a trap and we have to um, find a way out of those traps. So I think it's key to find images, illustrations, maps, photographs, graphics that show us, um, let's say, a different image of the urban than these classical, these classical images. I think that's, uh, that, that's pretty decisive. Um, and I think that's something where we have to develop new um, aesthetical means. We have to develop new ideas how we could symbolize uh, the urban that is not this very classical um, postcard image um, of, uh, of our cities. I think that's that's really um, an endeavor. That's, that's really a challenge to do that. And we tried to do that also um, while we were working on our um, with the ETH Studio Basel at, um, um, at, the, at, at the portrait, an urban portrait of Switzerland, and we developed quite some um, ideas and uh, we, we tried a lot of different ways 
how we could how we could illustrate and how we could symbolize uh, the urban that is that is not this classical city image. Um, I think that's a that's a major a major um, um, challenge, and we are only at the beginning of that. That's good, thank you. And uh, now we have uh, a question which is going to be written by uh, Olivier Roy Bayargon. So, please, Olivier, um, in this case, when we have uh, written questions, uh, we normally read them aloud so that after we can produce uh, a uh, concealed audio file. Otherwise, uh, after the audio file, it's not very uh, uh, easy to understand because we don't know what uh, you are answering to. In this case, uh, since you are two, one of the authors uh, can read aloud the question and the other can begin the answer. Can you do that, uh, Christian and, and Neil? Um, I'm happy to read it since that means Christian has to answer it. <laughs> um, no, no, I'm just joking. Um, I'll go ahead and read it since I spoke up first, but Chris John, let's see, let's, after we read it, let's see who wants to answer it. So thank you so much for this essential contribution on such a fundamental issue. As per usual, my question subtext is, so what? Where do we go from here? Recurring participants will understand. So I am sorry if it takes you far away from the scope of your article. Would you go so far as to argue that beyond usual theoretical biases and methodological deviations, the world population does not intrinsically live in any particular kind of age at all these days, i.e. that no clear combination of contemporary discursive, ideological, political, cultural, social, demographic, economic, or environmental aspects would actually constitute a particular type of global conjuncture typical of the past and next few years or decades? Question. Um, Christian, I could go first or feel free to take it away, yeah? Yeah, go on, it's fine. Yeah, okay. So, very interesting question. Um, my initial reaction is this. Um, part of what we are doing in this paper is reflecting on the um, possibilities and limits of different predominant indicators of a phenomenon that we all care about. The phenomenon that we all care about as urbanists is obviously urbanization. The problem from which the article begins is that the dominant indicator in terms of which that phenomenon has been defined is population. Now, we care a lot about population and the distribution of population matters. The problem is that the, as it were, spectacles, the analytical spectacles through which we think about the geographies of population are thoroughly misleading. They're thoroughly misleading. They're, they're the same ones as one of our authors, a critical demographer named David Satterthwaite. He's not only a critical demographer, but he also engages with, de with demography. As David Satterthwaite argues, um, we're still essentially using, or the UN is still essentially using, the same analytical spectacles for thinking about the geography of population that Kingsley Davis was using in the 1950s. So point A is that we need, even if we're interested fundamentally in spatial demography, which I've learned a ton about in writing, um, working on this article with Chris John, um, we need a different framework. And there are a number of critical demographers that are grappling with that question in part by using geospatial data. And let me just give one quick example. So there's now um, new spatial data, uh, geospatial data that's available on ambient population density, which basically is an algorithm to predict the distribution of people during the course of a working day instead of just um, localizing them wherever they sleep at night. So there are problems with that method as well, but it immediately yields a very different visualization of population distri distributed across space. Basically, urban space becomes a lot more expansive in territorial terms than it does in the mainstream urban age maps. So that's all on the one hand, that even if we want to look at population, we need a different framework for doing it. And the, again, the dominant framework, I mean, it's it's a simple point, easily summarized, but it has massive implications for the world. The dominant framework that's used by the most important global uh, or international organizations um, that generate 
sort of international policies related to these matters, the, the, um, the, the United Nations, the World Bank, the WHO, and so forth, the framework is still based on this kind of sim simplistic urban age city-centric model. So that's number one. And number two, as we indicate about two-thirds of the way through the article, even if one is committed to trying to come up with a universally agreed upon set of indicators for measuring, as it were, in empirical terms, urbanization, um, there are a whole other set of indicators that we might um, add to the equation, which, again, in different traditions, people have tried to do this. So you can bring in not just population size, but population density. You can bring in land use. You can bring in connectivity. You can bring in environmental impacts. You can bring in a lot of other factors which immediately complicate our understanding and our mapping of urbanization. So in sum, I mean, I really do um, appreciate the so what question. And there are many different dimensions to that so what question. For the moment, and again, we can unpack different layers of that so what question because it's something we both care about quite a lot. For the moment, the response is that, well, the um, you know, any number of major institutions in the world are concerned to generate policies that are oriented towards purported urban conditions. And yet they measure that urban condition in an extremely limited way, um, both in empirical terms and in epistemological terms. So the question is, what happens if we reinvent the set of indicators and the set of geographical lenses through which we think about that phenomenon, that opens up a whole set of new horizons, both for research and eventually, I mean, maybe we can come to this in this conversation for, for policy making. We haven't fully worked out the policy implications of our analysis, but it's something that we care a lot about. And we definitely, through writing this paper, have become pretty convinced that um, the dominant international urban policies that are mobilized in the world right now are based on a, a pretty limited understanding of what they're actually trying to influence. Um, Chris John, do you want to come in on this? Well, yes, I mean, I fully agree with that. Um, and I mean, it's really, it's really important here to, um, to look at the ideological function of those kind of constructions uh, that then at the end are called H, okay? So, um, of course, the urban H, um, this is a, it is a construction, it is a social construct, it's, it has it has often a kind of an ideological basis and also an ideological goal that means to define, um, let's say, the main fields of action um, of our societies and to try to um, put forward that. I think a very good example, I mean, urban age is one example. Uh, another example that goes in a similar direction is, um, is the whole debate about global sustainability. Um, that's also one of those constructions that um, defines, let's say, one of the major problems of the world, and at the same time give already an answer in what direction that possible um, um, consequences and possible actions uh, could go. So we have always to be very critical about those kind of constructions. But then at the same time, um, I'm also not advocating to say, okay, we are just living in a huge mess and we don't know where we are living. I think these kind of constructions have a necessary aspect um, precisely because, of course, we need a kind of orientation. We need some kind of, um, let's say, idea about what are the main topics um, that are challenging our world today and what could be the direction in which we are looking for possible answers and for possible actions uh, towards um, a, a different future. I think that's key. So I wouldn't say that uh, we, we don't live in an age, because um, the question of whether we live in a certain age or not is a question of how we define that and how we construct it. Um, and as I indeed think that we could today uh, define certain, certain um, I think, key elements of um, of, of the actual of the actual development of the world, um, I think that is indeed possible and, and it is necessary to debate about it. 
but the, but the problem is that most of um, uh, of the let's say of the foundations of those constructions are in a certain way naturalized. That means that they are not that they are not um, openly debated. And I think again the urban age um, is a very good example for that. So um, this the definition of um, what is urban and what is not urban and uh, with the definition of urbanization uh, as just the growth of cities um, and um, with this kind of um, um, let's say almost official statement now more than half of the population um, is living in urban areas uh, it is a kind of naturalization of that process so it it, it is a let's say a kind of a false evidence um, oh yes so we have to focus on those processes and they are almost naturally given and i think that's the main point so we have to dig deeper and we have to understand the foundations of those claims and of those constructions so what um, means yes we have to understand what are the foundations of the let's say the global discourse that is going on today and maybe we should also develop alternative options for discourses that are against this mainstream and that are much more in favor of, uh, let's say, um, um, oppositional um, views of the world. That is great. Thank you. Now we have uh, another question. Just Olivier just say that I could not agree more. Thank you. So he closes the discussion about this uh, this issue. And we have a comment by Linsai Ong. I'm gonna open her uh, microphone now. Uh, Linsai, can you, are you able to speak? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, hi Linsai. <laughs> hi, hi Christian. <laughs> Hello Neil as well, it's nice to meet you virtually. Um, I, I appreciated very much in the article how you describe this urban age theory as sort of a part of the convenient maiden narrative to characterize the urban conditions that to some signify a new and, and potentially very scary paradigm. Uh, it makes me wonder what kind of terms we would have used to describe the urban if we had, as you also mentioned later in the article, uh, rolled our theories from beyond the sort of context of Europe and North America from the beginning. Um, I also found it rather shocking how outdated these methodologies of the major institutions were in regard to data collection and, and especially mapping, um, particularly the policy by the UN, uh, which have such sweeping consequences for the developing world, uh, such as the cities without slums attitude from their Millennium Development Goals. Um, in my own research that I do in, in South Africa, these have often been applied across the board without question to justify, for example, the raising of informal settlements. In that light, where do you think the concentration of power primarily lies today in regard to urbanization processes as far as policymaking is concerned? And would you still describe urbanism as a way of life in contemporary times? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I hand over to you, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, maybe I'll take the second part first. Um, so, the urbanism as a way of life is, um, I mean, those are both two really excellent but also quite complex questions. So, um, a few reflections. Urbanism as a way of life obviously is a concept, I think as everyone knows, which comes from Lewis Worth's really quite fundamental intervention in the 1930s. And, you know, in a nutshell, the claim was that um, within settlements that, um, that uh, have certain kinds of conditions, so large populations, heterogeneous populations, and densely patterns, certain ways of life, certain routines and modes of social interaction and behavior would emerge. And so it's a kind of paradoxical claim because on some level it's easy to read Lewis Worth, as I did for many years, as basically saying that that condition, or those conditions, those modes of life associated with the urban are confined to the city. And that basically it's a sort of totally city-centric theory. But what's interesting about the argument, if one reads it through the lens of some of the um, moves that Chris John and I have been trying to make, is that it's actually a, a kind of, there's a more sophisticated moment of that article. I like to call it 
a notion of um, radiant urbanism in the sense of urbanism as a way of life radiating outwards from the city into a, a whole range of other, other settlement types because the um, in both terms the cultural influence of the city is as it were projected or it radiates outwards from the city and then if you fast forward from the 1930s if you take that argument to heart and you fast forward from the 1930s to you know our current moment if urbanism as a way of life has been projected outward from the cities into other settlement types, which are themselves obviously undergoing rapid changes during the many waves of global urban restructuring that we've seen since then, then at some point the, the specificity of urbanism as a way of life starts to blur, and it's certainly quite geographically variegated. So Worth obviously is writing in a certain moment and he can't really take it forward, but um, the specificity of urbanism as a way of life is um, is fully um, almost dissolved, or certainly it becomes so homogenous that it's almost impossible to generalize about it anymore. The way that Lewis wants to try to is there a single urbanism, whether in Euro America or in the so-called global South or any place else? Arguably, there are many urbanisms. There are many modes of life in Lefebvre's terms, many modes of forms of everyday life that crystallize in all of the different urban conditions that we're seeing around the world, whether in dense, uh, highly populated city centers, but also across the urban fabric of the entire world. And that opens up new horizons for thinking about, um, for, well, it opens up new horizons for doing research on, on what that might look like. So that's a long-winded answer to your question, but it's in a certain way a deconstruction and also reconstruction of the worthy and problematique. In other words, he tried to generalize about possible social, behavioral, cultural outcomes that might exist or might be projected from particular settlement types into the rest of the world. And I guess what we're saying is that, well, that's um, no longer possible. If it even was possible then is maybe an open question too, but it's, it's no longer possible because the global urban condition has become so differentiated and variegated but at the same time, I guess I would I would underscore, you know, coming from a Lefebvrean rather than Worthian framework, we're very, very interested in everyday practices, everyday spatial routines, everyday forms of experience that crystallize in conjunction with the ongoing forward motion of the urbanization process. So the kind of set of issues that Lewis Worth and many others, including Georg Zimmel back in those times, were interested in need indeed to remain um, fundamental um, for urban studies, but we need to rethink our, our, our geographical lens for, um, for exploring that. I mean, many you know, of my colleagues in the world of sociology who still work in the Chicago school tradition generate incredibly productive and interesting research on these questions, but they're still confined to the same kinds of dense urban neighborhoods that Lewis Worth and Robert Park and Ernest Burgess studied, you know, almost a hundred years ago. And it's not that we would dismiss that kind of research. On the contrary, it's, it's super interesting and super relevant. Um, but it's a question of um, uh, expanding our sense of possible sites for that kind of research far beyond those traditional kind of human ecologies which the Chicago School studied. Um, in terms of the, the first part of your question, which again would require a much longer answer than even the long answer I just gave to the second part of your question, is there a center of power in the current um, formation of planetary urbanization? And again, th like if other people want to weigh in on this question, maybe we can approach it in several steps. Um, but in order to avoid launching into kind of a mini you know, discourse on this just on my own. For the moment, what I would say on that is that we um, we actually think that the current formation of urbanization is, is quite multicentric. I mean, there are a number of different major institutional actors who are collectively engaged in producing the current formation of planetary urbanization. It's something that in some of our more concrete research forays we're um, exploring and the list of actors probably won't surprise, and institutions probably won't surprise anyone in this conversation. So obviously transnational corporations are playing a major role in a whole range of different sites from the big dense city centers to the broader 
infrastructural fabrics and zones of agro-industrial transformation, resource extraction, etc. So the, the corporate geographies of those spaces are central. So the TNCs, the same kinds of actors that economic geographers studying transnational production networks focus upon are central to our work. Just as importantly, um, states at a variety of different spatial scales. So Christian and, and I both come from a background in which we spent a lot of time studying the political mediation of urbanization process, processes, the role of territorial regulation in the production of space. So we're very interested still in the role of state strategies in promoting the current formation of planetary urbanization. But again, it's not a single state that's doing it. There are a whole range of different urbanization strategies in different parts of the world. One consequence of our approach is that we need to study those urbanization strategies as they emerge in different global regions instead of just assuming there's a single urbanization strategy associated with the urban age. There are a variety of urbanization strategies. And finally, again, building on Lefebvre's ideas, we believe that urbanization is fundamentally contested um, on the ground in everyday life. There are a whole range of social movements, again, within cities and beyond cities which are contesting the current form of urbanization, trying to reappropriate space for um, social reproduction, for collective life, for common life, um, against the kind of strategies of enclosure and privatization, which seem to be the kind of modus operandi, modus operandi of contemporary urbanization. So it's hardly simply imposed from above. It's always contested through um, social, social movements and social mobilizations. But again, analyzing that requires that we move to a more concrete level of, of abstraction than the one that we're predominantly on um, in this particular article. Um, sorry, everyone, for such a long-winded answer. I, I did the best I could to um, keep that concise. Um, Christian, do you want to come in on this? Well, I mean, I think it was great. The, the second part, the second point was great. You explained your ex explained really in a, in, a, in a very clear way. Um, so I, I will not enter this debate uh, again. I think that's, that's perfect for the moment. Maybe just um, a short, um, let's say, addition to the first point. Uh, so to the question of the um, urbanism as a way of life. Um, I think if we, um, let's say, if we construct our categories for analysis, and that's precisely the point. So urbanism as a way of life. So we have a kind of urban condition and we have a rural condition. So we are back on that on that distinction. And so what is urban, what is rural? Um, in the classic idea, it is um, the, the, the always, let's say, the, the conviction that um, if we say, okay, I'm living in a city or I'm living somewhere in the countryside, that this makes a major difference for our lives. Um, and as long as this is the case, we could support in a certain way this distinction. Um, but if we look today, um, then we can ask, um, maybe not all over the world, but in many parts of the world, um, I mean, is that really the main distinction? I mean, if we go to London and we can ask, okay, um, oh, we are living in London, but I mean, this makes a huge difference whether this is, um, a, let's say, a banker living in London uh, or there is a homeless living in London. I think the, 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 condition, the living conditions are totally different. Of course, the same is true for most of the cities of this world, um, but at the same time, we could go to certain so-called rural areas and we could ask, oh, what are the living conditions? And uh, we, I mean, I don't go now into details, but I could tell you quite some stories about uh, living on the, on the so-called countryside and then to ask, well, is that life really so different from the life um, in the, in, in, in the so-called uh, cities? Um, and then we find out, wow, well, yeah, there, there might be some differences, but maybe they are not decisive anymore. Uh, and I think that's the point. So I think in many, many uh, countries, especially um, in the North and the West, 
I think the differences between living in the so-called countryside and living in the so-called so cities, those differences are not key anymore, but the, let's say the differences of the living conditions in the different places are much higher. So let's say the, the small scale, um, let's say um, uh, spatial differentiations are much, much more important than the large scale uh, differentiations. I think that's, that's a key element. And um, if we go to, let's say, places like India or Africa, or um, then of course we still have very, very distinct uh, situations in the so-called rural areas, but at the same time they are now um, changing quickly. Um, and I think uh, it is decisive to focus on those changes. So not to the, let's say, the status quo, not to say, oh yes, this is, oh yeah, this is still rural. So we, we are still in a certain way, we affirm, oh yeah, rural areas, they still exist because we found some, we found some, some villages and they are really rural. No, that's not the point. The point is that um, the processes are going on and the processes are changing these living conditions sometimes in a really um, breathtaking speed. I think that's the that's the main point. So that at the end, to say we are um, we are we have now an urban way of life, or we have still some rural way of lives. I think they are. I think these distinctions are not very meaningful anymore. So even the term urbanism as a way of life doesn't really help us anymore. I think yeah. if you want to understand the living conditions, the concrete living living conditions of people, then we I think we need a different vocabulary. To, to really grasp those differences. I think that's, that's for me, the, let's say, um, the, the analytical starting point for, um, for a renewal of those, of those categories. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I can open now inside home to see if she would like to add something to this. And after there are several other uh, virtually right, uh, reason hands. Inside? Yeah, um, I, I couldn't agree more with that. I think it's uh, it, sort of for someone coming from an architecture background, it was very interesting to go into the to the leading Lewis Firth a couple of years ago and to see these ideas about what urbanism means. Because for for me as someone who has is from the United States, living in Switzerland and studying Africa, I found the conditions also to be very similar. So this idea of studying processes as opposed to settlement typology seems to me a very very natural thing. Um, so I, I enjoy reading about it in your research, and thank you very much for your answers. Thanks. Thank you, Sai. Okay, now uh, we we can uh, have one question of, by uh, Basak, and uh, here it is. Uh, it came. So, like before, I think that before uh, was uh, Neil who who has read the question. Now it can now it can be Chris. Yeah. No? <laughs> okay. My English is not so um, elegant, of course. Uh, okay, I try. Because so. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it gives uh, even more uh, kind of sense of belonging. <laughs> it's not in English, uh, which is. Uh, it's not, well, it's not globish. Uh, we need to speak English uh, which can reflect uh, where we belong to. So it's <laughs> That's good. true. <laughs> That's true. Okay. So um, the paper discusses the dominant theory on we live in an urban age planet, which looks at the world through binary lenses, um, i.e. the urban and the rural. I think this discourse also creates a hierarchy between urban and rural, in which the rural is under the symbolic hegemony of the dominant urban paradigm. I would like to ask whether qualitative ethnographic research has a place in this new vocabulary, which can reveal the meanings attached to different realms, urban, rural, ex-urban, town, and so forth, by people. In my research on the gated communities of Istanbul, one of the largest cities in the world, the respondents, residents in gated communities, revealed differences between their lives inside gated communities and those in Istanbul, city center. Despite the current debates on the blurring boundaries between different realms, urban rural, I found this interesting. Okay, thank you for your suggestions and your paper. 
I don't know. Shall I just go on with? Um, yeah, you should take that, Chris John. This is definitely something you you've worked on quite a bit, actually. Yes, yes, because um, I mean, I mean, one of our projects is precisely a comparison of urbanization processes in eight large cities uh, or eight, eight, let's let's say eight large urban regions starting with Tokyo um, and go on with Lagos and also Istanbul is part actually of our, our research. So um, I think it is indeed uh, I think an important point to make qualitative ethnographic research. It's actually precisely what we are doing in our comparison and actually it is almost the only way we can do it because the statistics um, in, in especially in compare those very different urban areas, the statistics are just hopeless. I mean, if you want to compare Los Angeles and Lagos, I mean, I mean the statistics on Lagos they are not not really um, not really precise and um, not really helpful in most of the cases. So. Um, so what we did was precisely work with um, qualitative research and with um, ethnographic methods. Uh, I think that's a very, very important source. Even today, where we have seemingly this uh, big data, um, we have these kind of um, ideas that we can calculate everything out of, the, of, the, of all those, let's say, um, uh, floods of data that are available, but at the end we will not understand this world with all those data because we have to go back to the very concrete and the very concrete is everyday life and everyday life at the end is not the result of a, of, of a lot of data but it is the result of um, what is really going on in that life and for that we need precisely ethnographic research. So I think indeed it is key and um, we, I can just tell you that we develop, we are developing now at the moment a new vocabulary of urbanization and we are just developing it uh, on the basis of that kind of research, of that kind of um, ethnographic qualitative uh, research. Of course, of course, you also use statistics if you have them and of course you use also uh, other, other um, sources and data, but, but the, basic, uh, the basic analysis is, is qualitative. So um, I, I agree. And then um, I think with your comparison of um, gated communities in Istanbul and, um, um, and um, let's say the city center of Istanbul, um, yes, uh, I think that's precisely what, what's happening now and that is precisely what I meant with the different worlds that are coming into existence in our, in, in, in our urban areas. Um, uh, yes, uh, there are really different worlds um, uh, developing um, uh, in Istanbul and in many other cities, but besides in Istanbul, um, it is, um, and these different worlds are also very much reflecting processes of immigration. Um, and I think precisely the, the actual fights on, um, on the city center of Istanbul, so on, um, um, on, um, um, on, on, I mean, Getty Park and uh, and um, and Toxic Square. I think there we see uh, now really a battle uh, or a fight on um, the, the very definition of the urban um, that becomes, let's say, dominant for Istanbul. And um, I mean, there is an interpretation, for instance, by um, uh, by Orhan Eisen, who says um, that the fight um, on, 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 um, on Toxin Square is a fight between different worlds. Uh, and one world is precisely the world of those gated communities um, that try to get some, let's say, hegemony over the definition of what is urban in Istanbul um, in, in relation to the, let's say, um, the much more um, cosmopolitan, um, um, let's say, part of the population of Istanbul. So yes, uh, there are there are fights going on, on 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 the definition of the urban, and I think this is precisely the reason why we need a much more differentiated, um, let's say, um, 
a set of instruments and of um, of concepts that you're able to analyze that because it is not just a question between urban rural or urban not urban or urban suburban. I think all those dichotomies uh, are not are really not uh, useful anymore uh, in order to understand what's really going on. I think the, the actual processes are much much more complicated and much more differentiated. So yes, I fully agree. So I see there are other people waiting in line, but if I may just add really quick addition to what Christian said. I mean, so there's a distinction that comes from, I believe, Bourdieu between categories of analysis and categories of practice. And this is quite relevant to this discussion. So categories of practice are, of course, the concepts that people use in everyday life to make sense of the world. And categories of analysis are the concepts that we use in critical social science to analyze processes of social life, social transformation. And part of the problem from, I think, our point of view with contemporary but also historical urban studies is that it hasn't adequately distinguished its categories of analysis from the categories of practice that are used in everyday life. In other words, we take on board concepts of urban, suburban, and rural, among others, that are used in everyday practice as if they were also adequate conceptual tools for social analysis. And part, I mean, again, a lot more could be said about this, but I just think that distinction is relevant to this point about the categories of practice that people use, for example, in Istanbul um, in relation to our categories. Like clearly, I mean, again, it's a much longer discussion, but just in a nutshell, clearly people in the world continue to use categories like city, suburb, rural, etc. And that's itself an interesting sociological problem. Like what, you know, how do we make sense of that? Um, there's a very interesting paper by David Walksmith in Society and Space called City as Ideology. It was in, I think, the last, one of the last issues in which he reflects on that problem. The fact that people use such categories doesn't therefore legitimate our continued uncritical appropriation of those categories for purposes of critical socio-spatial analysis. We may need different categories precisely in order to make sense of the use of such categories in everyday life to make sense of um, spatial differentiations. OK, thank you. Now we have uh, um, someone else, uh, Laura Wentz, uh, which uh, is uh, next in line. And her microphone, so she can uh, she can uh, speak with us. Uh, Laura, you are on. Yes. yes, thank you so much, Giovanni. Um, sorry, I joined half an hour late, so I apologize if my first question has already been posed. Um, so thank you, Neil and Christian, for this um, excellent paper. I've got two uh, questions that are not really uh, related, but my first one. Uh, revolves around the Anthropocene um, as another not quite as popular as the urban age but still very often repeated scientific meaning. Uh, do you see a relationship between this declaration of an Anthropocene and the formation of an urban uh, age? Um, how are they maybe mutually supportive or how is the urban age maybe a key myth that is sort of within captured within this declaration of an Anthropocene? And then my second question is, uh, yeah, well, if Olivier is the man for the so what questions, I think I'm always more the yellow pre press of this group because I'm very curious about the social life, uh, as Jamie Peck put it, of the articles we discuss. Um, so how have or how is the response been by apostles of the urban age like Ricky Burdett um, and and also yeah has there been a response has there been a, a debate or a discussion um, because I mean one can really spin quite a few almost like conspiracy con conspiracy theories about you know why the Alfred Herrhausen Foundation would fund this with such great sums because I mean the urban as a pivotal means of production which has also been a very popular line of debate in this uh, author meets critics um, and how they've also added to identifying if not even branding those paradigmatic urban age cities um, almost creating new league tables which then exclude other information secondary cities edge cities these peri-urban areas, etc. So I would just be uh, curious uh, if you could engage with either or, or both of these questions. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you. Those are great. Those are awesome questions. Um, Christian, do you want to go first on this one? Well, or, I think you I'm happy to you. give some answers to the Anthropocene, and then maybe I give some answers about branding cities. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, we get the Anthropocene question quite a lot, and so it's become clear to us that at some point in one of our, you know, upcoming papers or in the book that we're writing, we need to um, we need to clarify our position. So again, a topic on which much could be said, but the short answer is this. So we I think among other differences, there are two very fundamental differences like epistemological and empirical between our approach and the approach that's increasingly being popularized around the Anthropocene. The first is that we don't think it's just a generic human geological epoch. Um, as some Marxist critics of the Anthropocene have argued, it's better described as a capital Ocene. In other words, it's the age of capital, and it's, an, it's the age of capitalist urbanization. The processes of planetary urbanization that we are analyzing are directed to the capitalist form of industrialization, above all post-1850. So Earl Ellis, who's an ecologist, who is one of the, um, among many proponents of the concept of the Anthropocene, is a friend of mine and someone who's um, spent quite a bit of time in the last year or two at the Harvard GSD, where I teach, and I've had the chance to dialogue with Earl quite a lot. And it's, it's a very interesting debate, but it's clear that the Industrial Revolution is important within that literature, but it's, um, it's, it, it doesn't represent the kind of qualitative break that it is in our framework. And furthermore, within that framework, it's just the Industrial Revolution. For us, it's the capitalist, it's the process of capitalist industrialization with many important consequences for how we understand the specific actors, processes, and consequences. So that's one important difference. Another important difference is that the Anthropocene literature has um, a particular mapping of human impact on the global environment in which cities actually represent a very small part of the human footprint. So I've spent quite a lot of time looking at the, some of the very interesting visualizations produced by Earl Ellis and others within that literature. And it's pretty interesting that the model of the city or of the urban that they use is pretty similar to that of the urban age discourse. It's just basically large, dense population centers. And they do um, recognize other human imprints, but they're not connected to urbanization. And what's also quite interesting from the point of view of some of the work that we're doing in the Urban Theory Lab is that within the Anthropocene literature, significant portions of the planet are still relatively untouched by human impact. So I w again, I won't go into the details here, although I might upload a visualization. Um, we've looked very carefully at some of the land use and land cover maps that have been produced by scholars within the Anthropocene literature, among others, Earl Ellis. And it's quite remarkable because areas like the oceans or the Sahara Desert or the Amazon are coded as relatively low impact. And the main differentiations that are depicted on those maps are simply um, ecological differentiations. In other words, among different vegetation types or soil types. And a lot of the work that we're doing in the Urban Theory Lab um, has shown, I think, in a pretty dramatic way that vegetation types are, of course, important within those areas, but there are all kinds of industrialization processes that are ricocheting across the Pacific Ocean, the Arctic, the Amazon, the Himalayas, Siberia, the Sahara, the Gobi Desert, etc., connected with the extension of the urban fabric. So our insistence on a much broader notion of the urban than the one used by the Anthropocene literature also yields a very different cartography in which the so-called Anthropocene, it's not just a capital of scene, but it's one in which the fabric of urbanization is increasingly thickening across zones of the world, which, which within the Anthropocene literature are depicted as basically wilderness. We're increasingly skeptical about the notion of um, the wilderness. Maybe just one or two sentences before I turn it back to turn it over back to Christian 
on the reception of our work among the um, proponents of the urban age. Um, I just want to clarify something about this. So we use um, the work of the LSE Deutsche Bank um, colleagues as an example of the urban age discourse. But our intellectual target in this article is not specifically the LSE De Deutsche Bank team. I mean, they are one among many exemplars of the particular epistemological framework that we're criticizing. They're a, particular pro a particularly prominent example of that framework because of the ways in which they use the notion of the 50% urban threshold to brand their particular project. And there are very interesting politics and geopolitics and geoeconomics behind the Deutsche Bank's interest in, well, it's not even the Deutsche Bank directly, it's, as you, as you say, it's the Alfred Herrhausen Society. Um, but there's some interesting, you know, kind of geoeconomic issues behind their interest in funding that project. And there are many different aspects of that project that one could critically engage with. Um, but ultimately, our, our kind of intellectual target around the notion of the urban age is much broader. Um, just a few more quick sentences on this matter. So I was actually invited by Ricky Burdett in the fall to contribute to the last urban age conference in Delhi which I was, um, you know, I thought was a very interesting um, invitation given the ways in which we've kind of publicly criticized that concept. And I accepted the invitation and participated in the, um, in the, in the conference and gave a paper in which I, I made some of these points. And it was quite an interesting conversation. I mean, obviously most of the conference focused on, you know, the big cities of India and elsewhere in the world. But um, the reception in that particular context was, um, I wouldn't say it was unsympathetic. I don't necessarily see that they're going to change the focus of their particular project, which really is on the big cities. But they seem to recognize, at least in, in the conversations that we had, the need to bring in um, some broader um, territories and landscapes into their um, analysis. Whether that will happen in their project or in other projects is an open question. But it was certainly a very friendly, very vigorous um, dialogue, which um, I think we need more of um, within this field. Um, over to you, Christian. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great, Neil. Um, because um, I I think to the to the response that we got on our paper, I think that was not so, especially by um, by the urban age people. I mean, there was not a great um, agree about it. Um, at least from my point of view, uh, yeah. so they, they, they didn't seem to be very um, provoked by our critique. Um, and um, I, I think that shows that, um, of course, the main, the main target of our critique is, um, is, 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 is now not, um, let's say, the LSE or, or certain uh, researchers uh, in, that, that, are, that are working in that field, but it is it has precisely to do with this tendency that we in a, in our new paper now call a kind of urban triumphalism so um, and it comes from a title um, by Edward Glaser um, the triumph of the city and um, uh, I mean that's indeed something that um, when I when, when we when we looked on on, on those kind of problems there's a whole range of publications that are going in the same in the same direction and that are propagating now um, the kind of the cities as let's say um, the places where you have to be and if you are not in those um, let's say the decisive cities of the world then you almost missed um, uh, your life actually I mean um, and that um, in, in, in another context, we tried to, let's say, theorize that with the concept of the new metropolitan mainstream. That means there is a new mainstream coming, kind of developing in the world, um, that precisely declares the metropolitan as, uh, let's say, the, the, the ultimate goal of, um, of development in a certain way, and especially the ultimate goal of all the people, uh, or the ultimate destination uh, for all that, um, uh, that that really want to um, make some, some, some want to reach some, uh, some position in their life. And I think 
uh, you said um, it, it is almost a kind of, of, of conspiracy theory behind that. So, um, uh, so somebody produces in a certain way that aid stream, and somebody uh, propagates all those, um, uh, let's say, future cities uh, and, and important places uh, of the world. And I think, yes, uh, of course, I mean, behind that are massive economic and political interests. I think that's that's no question at all. And of course, uh, there is a certain tendency now to, um, I mean, the city branding, I mean, is, is one of the, uh, of the, of the um, I think, the, the almost routine operations today. Um, and to brand cities with all sorts of um, instruments, um, and especially, of course, with architecture and uh, with all those uh, flagship projects that are now um, kind of, um, I would say, almost um, devastating now our cities because uh, every city needs not one flagship project, which would be logical because, I mean, a flagship, a flagship is the one ship in a fleet. If the whole fleet has only flagships, uh, there is no there is no fleet anymore. I mean, it's hopeless. Then, um, uh, so it makes no sense to have. Uh, dozens of flagship projects in, in every city. But that's exactly what's going on now. Every year, a new flagship. Um, and of course, that has a, a very clear relationship to the, to the whole process of capital accumulation today that is very much focused precisely on, uh, on the construction sector and um, of, uh, on, the, on, the, on the construction of, of new houses and uh, of, of new settlements and of, of new important, um, let's say, um, um, well, skylines and, and, and all other uh, sorts of things. So the so the um, I think the construction sector and and, uh, and the speculation on on um, on the land is at the moment one of the key indeed one of the key economic sectors uh, in in our in our uh, global economy. And so there is yes there is uh, of course uh, a strong interest in um, um, kind of putting forward. Uh, those processes and in fooling even more um, the, um, the, um, um, well, the, 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 the construction of all sorts of, um, of new, um, um, let's say, well, almost new, new kind of cities in the cities. Um, and that has, um, I think, as a massive consequence um, that the that ours that, that let's say our especially our inner city areas are losing a lot of their urban qualities, their intrinsic existing urban quality. I think this is a massive process of um, well, we put it as a process of creative destruction. Um, so there is a massive destruction at the moment of, I would say, values of uh, especially everyday values and their replacement um, through all sorts of corporate um, of corporate architectures and of, of um, let's say, objects of um, international speculation. I think, yes, that is a process that has, um, that produces a lot of profits and has a lot of stakeholders that are profiting out of, out of those processes. I think, Yes, there is a. This is a. This is a major tendency, I would say, today, and um, it is. It is something that we have to face. Okay, and uh, we have the other four people, which uh, which is uh, which uh, raised their hands, and uh, we have uh, maximum uh, other half an hour. It means that. Uh, <laughs> Even if uh, it's uh, it's a real pleasure to to listen to you, you both Christian and uh, Neil, you you will need to to be quicker in your answers because otherwise we won't be able to do uh, it all in the in, in the time. Agreed, agreed, no problem. <laughs> we'll work on that. <laughs> thank, thank you. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, Laura uh, was saying uh, thank you very much for, for painting the bigger picture. Is an email. Okay. Now we have uh, um, an intervention by Federica Duca. Uh, she can, uh, yeah, for me to be very uh, in the night. 
Federica Duca, can you post your uh, your question now? You can do it now. Here it is. Okay. Okay, so it's it's my turn to read. I'll plunge right in just to save time. Um, so the question is as follows. Thanks for the article and for suggesting new conceptual insights to address the urban question. I do agree that the empiricism dominates much of the contemporary urban studies and that this could encumber a theoretical innovation. My question, similar to, to Bazak's, is what kind of empirical research do you think is needed to achieve a relevant theoretical perspective? In other words, what kind of methodology do you think scholars could use to fruitfully address your heterodox engagements? For instance, when you say the urban is not a universal form but a historical process, do you also have an idea how to understand, study, and unfold the historical process? Fabulous question. Absolutely wonderful. Um, we both have a lot to say about it, but we are under orders to be super concise. Christian, do you want to take a first stab at it? Um, oh, um, I'm, well, I'm happy to. If you want to take a minute, I'm happy to dive right in, as you wish. Okay, step in. Yeah, great. Step in. Okay. So, again, being very brief. So, the first thing that I would like to say about this, which is really important, I think, for us to clarify, is that we are fundamentally committed to heterodox approaches to urban studies. So we're making a lot of epistemological critiques. We're making a lot of epistemological pr uh, proposals. But we are not, I mean, again, we occasionally get this critique that we're advocating a totalizing perspective. And we really, we really want to clarify that is not our agenda. We are trying to destabilize certain inherited ways of thinking about and studying urban questions. We're trying to make a few proposals that open up different ways of thinking about familiar spaces or apparently familiar spaces, and which try to open up um, other spaces for systematic inquiry by urban researchers. So the first thing to say is that heterodoxy, um, and you use this word heterodox quite appropriately, Heterodoxy is a fundamental commitment to us. We have particular methodological orientations for certain questions that we are concerned with. We're both, we both come from a kind of political economy, regulation theory, Lefebvrean background. But those are pragmatic choices that we make in relation to particular concrete questions. There are many ways to do this. And we're learning a lot from the many heterodox engagements that are being elaborated in different sectors of urban studies. It's an interesting moment. So even though we could definitely elaborate some arguments about particular methodological strategies we are developing or mobilizing um, in order to confront certain kinds of questions, part of our, our kind of fundamental commitment is, is to heterodoxy. I mean, we, we can debate on a more concrete level what types of methods and categories are appropriate to what kinds of questions. But I think it's fair to say that both of us, whatever our particular preferences are and you know, orientations are in relation to urban research, we really believe in um, a kind of heterodox approach. We don't think it's a moment in which it's productive to kind of lock in a particular method um, that applies to everything. And furthermore, just as importantly, we're both very pragmatic. I think it's fair to say, again, we have particular orientations for thinking about capitalism, territorial regulation, everyday life, struggle, etc. But on some level, the choice of method has to be fundamentally made in relation to the research question that one has. So we have a lot of research questions that flow from this approach. So we have to get very concrete in order to lock in a particular method, because it, it just depends what you're trying to explain. So in that sense, again, it's, it's a very anti-totalizing approach. It's very pragmatic. Christian, over to you. <laughs> yes, I, I agree. Um, I mean, with the, with the point is very pragmatic. Um, I agree in the sense of that we, we, we really should use the really the, the wide variety of methods that um, that are available. I think here uh, I fully agree. So for me, I work with statistics, if that if that makes sense. And as I told already, I work with ethnographic methods, if if that is um, is something that produces the results we are looking for. But what I 
can also say is that I'm not so happy with the existing, let's say, not the question of methods. I think we have enough we have enough methods, but but the kind of let's say methodological design that is available. So here in in the, in the work we are doing in, in our different um, projects, um, we are really trying to to develop even new. Uh, methodological tools and methodological designs to approach precisely those those questions. So um, uh, we work with new forms of mapping, um, and we also try to reintroduce, and that's especially for the historical process. We try we are trying to reintroduce certain uh, methods of periodization, um, so to understand the historical trajectory or the pathways of organizations. Um, and to um, to make them um, in a certain way uh, open for comparisons. So that's something that we are just um, at the moment working on in our comparative project on these on these eight large um, areas. So, um, but I will not go into the details now. <laughs> but it is based on certain certain instruments that we got from regulation theory um, and some classical concepts of uh, how to do. Periodization, um, maybe less in, in, in historical sciences and more in um, social sciences. Yeah. But it, it needs experimentations. I think it is. It, it, if you want to address those questions, I think we should also think on the methods, and we should be inventive and experimental with the methods. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. Now we have uh, another. Or question by Dion Mahum. Now, who he, he will introduce himself? So, uh, which is better, Dion? Can you are you able to speak now? Yeah, thanks, Neil. Thanks, Christian, for the article. It made a clear uh, refocus. I think a slew of urban researchers, and I really appreciate that. Um, I'm curious if you guys have had a chance to read Richard Walker's response in City. I, I, that chuckle, I assume that's a yes. Um, I'm curious about kind of two points he made, which has been kind of a, a little bit of a thread that we've, we've heard here so far, and I'm, I'm hoping you guys can respond. One is that he notes that the urban is not a process, it's also an object. I'm, uh, you know, that seems kind of obvious. I'm hoping you guys can respond to that too. I don't think that you guys necessarily fell into that trap. But the other one was that this continuing thread that we need to pull, I'm going to quote him, he says, we need to pull back from the brink of totalizing urbanization to look more carefully at how cities penetrate, exploit, and subsume rural areas. Um, I'm hoping you guys can just respond to that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Christian, do you want to, um, do you want to do, do you want to go first, or should I, as you, as you wish? Go on, Neil. <laughs> we discussed that uh, in the last, uh, in the last weeks, you can imagine. <laughs> yeah, so so people may or may not be familiar. So we we published an article. It just came out like days ago in the journal City. We've mentioned it a few times towards a new epistemology of the urban, and um, it was a frustrating experience for us because corresponded a bit with Dick before the article was published, but we had no idea that a response, a very negative and polemical response, was going to be published right alongside of our of our article. So it was frustrating because. Maybe there needs to be some exchange about the article, but obviously we would have preferred to have many voices, not just um, our colleague Dick Walker in the mix, particularly given how negative he, he was about the article. So if people are interested, do have a look. We have already posted a detailed reply to the Dick Walker um, critique. Um, it can be found on Christian's website, which in a moment, in fact, Christian, if you have a moment right now, Maybe you could plug in the, um, the link to your website. And it's also immediately available on the Urban Theory Lab website, which I'll, as soon as I finish speaking, send a link. And you guys can read our response in detail. Um, part of the problem with the exchange, if that's what it is, is that Dick really um, caricatures and misrepresents huge aspects of our argument. So, we're definitely open for, as he puts it, intellectual combat, including hard-hitting combat. 
but it's difficult to do that against an opponent who basically just wants to discredit your argument, which unfortunately that seems to be what, what Dick was, um, was up to in that piece. But as you'll see, if you have a look at our response, you'll see that we spend a bit of time um, going through point by point any number of um, misrepresentations, caricatures of our work. But then at the end, there are a couple um, actually pretty interesting and important points of genuine disagreement, which it's a bit hard to find them amidst all the chaos and confusion that is kind of produced by Dick's kind of bulldozing through our, our article. Those are strong words, but that's really how we feel. It was a very unfortunate missed opportunity for a genuine dialogue because he, for whatever reason, wanted to engage so polemically to defend a different, a different model of what urban studies, in his view, should look like. So in terms of the question, um, I mean, it's such an old debate. I mean, is the urban a process or an object? Obviously, it's both. I mean, Dick studied under David Harvey, so he learned the lesson from David Harvey just as, as we have. So we're, we're sort of perplexed that that's even an issue we have to have a dis discussion about. Um, we're criticizing perspectives that kind of lock in a unit-based understanding of the urban, which obviously Dick Walker doesn't embrace. I mean, we build upon Dick Walker's work in so many ways to look at urbanization processes. So um, we don't really think that's a genuine bone of contention between our work and Dick Walker's work. We accept, we all embrace a processual approach to the urban. We're very critical of any number of mainstream models that, as we've been discussing for the last hour and a half, lock in a kind of notion of the city as a um, fixed artifact, as a bounded, self-enclosed unit. Um, we're interested in deconstructing that. At the same time, though, we would agree that there is a relative, relatively fixed materiality of urban landscapes, as David Harvey calls it, a structured coherence that emerges during the process of urbanization. And it's perfectly possible to um, sort of analyze that moment of tendential stabilization of socio-spatial relations, even while insisting, as Henri Lefebvre does, as David Harvey does, on the processual character of the urban. So we would classify that as um, an example of a, there's not a real disagreement there. We're a little perplexed as to why Dick makes such a big deal out of that one. Um, the other point that you raised, I've already forgotten, although I'm sure Chris John has something to say about it. So maybe I'll turn it back over to you, Chris John, for the rest of our response. <laughs> yeah, OK. No, I mean, um, for, for me, I, I would insist a, a short moment now in this question of how to analyze processes. Um, because I was, um, I was really very much irritated by this critique. Um, because, um, I mean, it is something that comes, um, that is actually the, the fundament of Henri Lefebvre's the production of space. I mean, um, it is precisely, I mean, in that term, the production of space. And uh, the usual idea of space is that space is something stable and it's a form or it is a structure or both. Um, and then and then, and then, then we have the term production. And then the point is we have to analyze it as a production process. And we have to look how those, uh, how those, how space is produced, and then suddenly out of that starting point unfolds now, let's say, um, a complete world. Um, and um, I, I think um, um, a world that shows how complex uh, space is and the production of space is. And I mean, the city, whatever we think what a city should be, but I think there is a certain agreement that the city is, a, let's say, a kind of a space. Um, and to compare now this analysis with the analysis of the sun or of rivers, I mean, um, I, was, I have to say I was shocked because this kind of, um, of level of debate is really, um, well, in French you would say, degré zero. So we are really on the, on, the, on the ground level of discussion because that we can't analyze social processes in the same way as we analyze physical processes. I mean, that should be pretty clear. And in a certain way, it shows that this critique of Walker um, is, really, is really something that was just um, 
point to make a critique, but he even didn't think at the end what he wrote, because he can, of course, do much better, and he knows that. It is ridiculous to insist in the fact that um, social processes are something different than, um, than physical processes on one point, and on the other point, it is also clear that um, Vogue knows precisely how to make analysis of process. So that's ridiculous. But it shows a little bit, uh, let's say, the character of that debate. So it is more a kind of an intervention to stop the debate um, and much less an intervention to bring the debate forward. And that is what's, what is really uh, annoying us and where we think, yes, we give some answers and you can, read, you can download it now from our homepage, but um, I don't think it makes sense to go into more details. I think that uh, we don't, uh, in order to allow uh, Gideon to to reply to that, so we need to give uh, the floor to Anthony to Anthony Levenda uh, for uh, for posting the, uh, his question. Please, Anthony, post it down. Okay, thank you, uh, Anthony. Um, Christian and uh, Neil, do you want that I read the, the okay. question for you? So you okay, can, I uh, think <laughs> So, um, thanks for the excellent article. My question regards the application of these theoretical orientations of planetary organization in the context of the global south. Also, to the center of theory, as you mentioned in the paper, from the global north, Euro-American context from scholars such as Ananya Roy and Jenny Robinson and many more, seems to already complicate our understanding of organization processes by pointing to the inadequacy of urban theory from the north to explain the urban conditions in the south. How do you think planetary organization may take on this global north-south binary and how might the work already being done from, for example, African urban scholars help to highlight the ways we need to critically investigate the contemporary ideologies of urbanization? Um, shall I just continue, Neil? Please do. Great question. Yes, it's a great question. And um, I think it's precisely one of the, I think it was the starting point um, that showed at a certain moment that our instruments um, and our, let's say, conceptional tools we had were not enough anymore. I mean, this is precisely the core of Walker's critique, but also the core of the critique by um, um, Alan Scott and Michael Storper, uh, that they are saying, well, we, we are already well equipped uh, with our with, with urban theory and with urban concepts and we should just apply them and work more rigorously with the, with the existing um, kind of uh, instruments. And what precisely the debate about uh, these developments in the Global South are showing is that um, this is not the case because there are a, a, a whole range of urban phenomena and urban processes that are not, that we cannot explain with the existing instruments. So we, we need to develop new instruments, new concepts uh, and so on to make those um, experiences and processes available to our analysis. I think the same is true with our understanding, Niels, and my understanding of extended organization where we came precisely to the same conclusion that we said, yes, there are new phenomena that we see and that we cannot analyze with the existing instruments. So we need to develop new understandings, new instruments, and especially new concepts. So here, I think that's a, that's a key point. Um, but at the same time, I would be a little bit skeptical about this north-south divide. Uh, in, a, in a recent article, um, in the in the in the handbook actually of the global south, uh, Jenny Robinson uh, precisely criticised that um, focus on the south and the north and the distinction between the two, um, and I agree with that critique, uh, adding that um, the today's uh, urban realities are much more complex. So again, um, I mean I'm 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 really not convinced by all those binary. Um, kind of oppositions like urban, suburban, urban, rural, and so on. And I'm not convinced neither by this distinction between the global south and the global north. I think 
it is much, much more complex and we should indeed, and that's a difficult task, but it's also a very challenging and a very inspiring task to develop a much broader um, framework uh, and, and a much broader vocabulary uh, and, and a much broader set of conceptional tools to analyze today's urban, urban realities. Yeah, great. I mean, I have a few thoughts on it, but maybe I'll, I'll pass because we're almost out of time and I believe there's another question. Maybe just two sentences, though, instead of a detailed response. We, it's important for us to underscore that actually um, we view our projects, we view our project as very much aligned and allied with a lot of the work that's being done in um, post-colonial urban studies. There are points of difference, some of which we allude to in the recently published city article, which I won't take the time to summarize now, but, um, but sometimes in the discussion of planetary urbanization in some recent commentaries were, were counterposed to post-colonial urbanism as a radically kind of opposed and much more totalizing perspective. And as Christian has explained, that's, that's really not the case. Again, there are different methodological and conceptual choices, but the shared kind of common ground is responding to contemporary processes of urbanization by developing alternative and more reflexive epistemologies. And again, there are different ways to do that, but that's a, um, a starting point. Um, that's a response which not everyone in contemporary urban theory would, um, would, would adopt, but it's something that we definitely share with our colleagues in post-colonial urban studies. Again, plenty of debates and disagreements to be elaborated upon, but that's a very important shared um, kind of analytic and epistemological concern. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, now we have uh, Kansu Chirek with uh, his question. He's ready to, to, to type, but he has done it already. Uh, after we will have uh, one last question by Anna Rosa uh, Cavalcanti, and uh, uh, I think that she can post it now so that uh, um, Christian and Neil can have uh, an overall uh, closing uh, remark on both questions. What do you think? Fun me. Okay, so Anna Rosa, please post your question. Okay. Okay, should I? Should I, thank you everyone, should I um, just go ahead and read these and then Chris John and I will figure out how to, um, how to land this um, conversation in a productive way? That's Is that great. okay, Chris John? It's a good idea. Okay, great. Okay, I will read as follows. So first of all, um, it looks like Anthony. Uh, thanks for the excellent article. My question, oh wait, sorry, am I reading, was that already said? No, no, okay, this is, I just wanted to make sure I'm reading the right one. Okay, thanks for the article. Second My one question. is the first one that we didn't answer. Okay, uh, we, oh yeah, I see, apologies. I was just repeating. Uh, there are two questions uh, by two people. Kansu Chivelek, we thank you very much for the discussion today. And the other one by Anna Rosa, which says thank you for your article, which I guess continues with new article and so on. So okay, got it. got it, got it, okay, let me go ahead and read just to save time. Okay, because of my connection problems, I missed some blocks of the conversation and maybe you talked about my point already. My question will go to Professor Schmidt. I wonder how you pick the eight cities that you work on. They are all the largest or capital cities of their countries. We criticize the hierarchies created between rural urban or among different regions, etc. And I wonder whether choosing these eight cities contributes to certain hierarchies between these big cities and the rest of the land in their countries. Why does the main body of research insist on looking at these same cities repetitively? Would be great if you could explain your reasons for choice of those cities. Okay, great question. Thank you very much. And I will proceed to read the last question before we figure out how to reply. Yep. Thank you for your article, which I guess continues with your new article towards the new epistemology of the urban. What is very interesting for me as a researcher of informal areas, participatory research in Brazilian favelas, is that the same confusing comprehension of binary categories are being applied 
to the study of this urban dimension, e.g. formal, informal, as your rural urban. Got it. Moreover, the same qualitative, excuse me, the same quantitative mantras are being disseminated as the fact that two-thirds of urban population will live in informal areas by 2050 in relation to your critique of the urban in question. Or even it seems that we can perceive the same apolitical study of boundaries, such as leaving behind that networks and commodities in the favela are rhizomatic, being included, being included the fact that both formal and informal dimensions exist in the production of both favela and traditional planning. Could you explain more about how your study could embrace this particular process? Wow, another great question. Thank you very much. Um, Chris John, do you want to take the first one since it was addressed to you and then if you would like to go ahead and spiral into the second one, that would be fantastic, as you wish. <laughs> okay, yes, okay. So I try to make it as brief as possible. Um, of course, I fully understand the, the question about these this huge cities. I mean, these are actually all mega cities. Um, and uh, I have to say that, um, I mean, my research projects um, uh, kind of um, uh, embrace a lot of different situations. So we made a full, a long research in Switzerland. Um, I'm doing a research on Havana. Um, at ETH through the Basel, we, we studied a lot of different areas like uh, the Nile Valley or, um, or, or many other, let's say, um, areas of extended urbanization. And now one of those projects is now this, this huge, this huge um, areas of these mega cities. So um, it, is, it is just for me um, a way to explore different urban conditions. And it was just the, the, the um, possibility to do this kind of research for, I mean, I don't go into the details, it was a great chance to, uh, to, to be able to do that, so, so we did it. And um, uh, the idea behind that was um, that we look on, let's say, in a way, similar urban conditions as they are produced in, in really large cities. Um, but uh, that research should be complemented by a research on, let's say, areas that are really areas of extended urbanization. So it's not at all the idea to privilege these huge uh, cities in relation to the, let's say, the hinterlands or the, the less populated areas or, in our terms, the uh, areas of extended urbanization. So um, it was just uh, the chance now to analyze those. Um, huge um, areas and to find some ways to develop um, our analysis of um, urbanization processes in, in, these, in these huge areas. They are not, not all of them are capital cities actually. Um, so um, Lagos is not a capital city and uh, Kolkata is not one and Hong Kong is, is also in that sense not a capital city. But anyway, um, so the idea was just to have eight cities across the globe that are huge and uh, where we can find a, a wide variety of different organization processes. So, the, um, so the, the, the selection was in a certain way also quite random. Um, but as Jennifer Robinson clearly, clearly showed, it is almost impossible to make a systematic choice if you make comparisons. So it's, you always have to, at the end, to decide what kind of places you want to compare. Um, but maybe I just make a link now with these uh, huge urban areas and our results, because one of the results that came out of that study, and we are just writing now the papers um, that are summarizing those results, is precisely about informality. Um, we again try to um, overcome this binary um, kind of um, concept of formal informal, and um, because in another project, we also analyzed, for instance, high income informal areas in, um, um, in Belgrade. So in informality is not something that is necessarily linked to poor areas. Um, but precisely in order to overcome this binary conception, 
we developed the concept of um, popular urbanization uh, on the one hand, and we have another concept that is plotting urbanization. And both concepts are um, bringing together experiences from all those uh, different cities and uh, trying to develop a new category or a new way of uh, treating those so-called informal areas, um, but along other categories. Because I fully agree that formal informal is something that in, in many respects um, are present um, in all our cities. I mean, it is not it is not a question of, um, I, mean, I mean, if you make an analysis, even in, in Western cities, you also have um, aspects of informality, illegality anyway. Uh, I think illegality is a, is a constant in, in most of the in most of the urban developments in the world. So, um, yes, we need a kind of different different look on those processes. So, uh, so I stop here. I could, of course, continue, but uh, I, I think I stop here. Yeah, no, great, great, Christian. I mean, really, really wide ranging. Um, this is such a wide ranging conversation. I mean, we're really grateful to everyone here for engaging with us. Maybe I'll just add a quick thought to the formal informal thing. So I don't know if um, folks in this conversation are familiar with the work of James Scott and his argument about seeing like a state, but it's really quite relevant to, um, to this last question about you know, the urban rural and the, the formal informal. Part of what Scott is interested in in that article and in that book, it's really a, it's a book length treatment, is um, what he calls state simplifications. And he talks about how um, large-scale bureaucratic institutions um, create a certain way of seeing the world which simplifies the complexity of life in order to facilitate certain kinds of um, strategies of intervention. So he gives the example of the construction of the Prussian forest and the whole idea of the German term is the Normalbaum, the normal tree. And the idea was that for the with the rise of scientific forestry in Prussia, the idea was to produce a, um, a forest that's oriented entirely towards timber yield. So your goal is to produce certain kinds of trees that are maximally knowable and calculable. And in so doing, you also construct a way of seeing the forest in which anything that doesn't facilitate the maximization of timber yield is, um, is either irrelevant or viewed as a threat. So all the other plant species and other kinds of animal species that might be in the forest are simply viewed as noise. And James Scott views that as a metaphor for the way that states try to view the world in terms of strategies of controlling population. And I think as those of you who have read the um, parts of the book will know, he also gives the example of modernist urban planning. Uh, uh, he calls it authoritarian high modernism which is an example of that kind of simplifying way of seeing. So I teach that um, a, a chapter of that book pretty regularly to my urban planning students at the GSD because it really opens up some important questions about the ways in which um, knowledge, dominant modes of knowledge about urban conditions often, often involve radical simplifications of the complexity of urban life precisely to facilitate particular kinds of urban strategies or urban interventions. And this point about the parallel between our critique of the urban rural division and the ways in which the informal formal division is, is also naturalized and mobilized, it really reminds me um, of this point that James Scott is, um, is making both of those modes of classific classification, um, the urban and the rural and the uh, the formal and the informal might be viewed as, whether they're state simplifications or more general kinds of simplifications, there are certain ways of knowing, in quotation marks, the urban condition that also radically blend out very important dimensions of urban realities. So even as we try to deconstruct them, it's very important, it seems to me, to try to understand what kinds of strategies, what kinds of interests, what kinds of power hierarchies those particular simplifications actually serve. And you know that, that's a whole other kind of conversation. But I really welcome the addition of the formal informal to this conversation. We can think of other dualisms in some ways. That's one of the major themes of this whole conversation, is to deconstruct the dualisms, not just the urban and the rural, but many others, the formal, the informal. We might add to that society nature. 
any number of, um, of dualisms. And, uh, and in deconstructing them, we should also, in other words, ask what sorts of interests and power relations do those simplifications actually serve. So I strongly recommend the, uh, the James Scott analysis to, um, to anyone who's interested in these kinds of questions. So I'm just looking. It looks like there's a new post here. Oh, this is from the AEG panel that someone has posted. Um, so hey, yeah. uh, we can um, we can close this this uh, this session for uh, for today. And uh, I need to thank uh, Neil and Christian for this uh, wonderful uh, uh, event. And this wonderful discussion we had it has, it has been really interesting and uh, insightful. So thank you. I don't know if you would like to to say hello. Or I would like also to thank Neil and Christian very much. I think uh, the the clarifications given to the criticisms are very important and very very well grounded. So I think everybody can go home with a lot of food for further thought. <laughs> yeah, okay, thank you very much. It was, a, it was an inspiring um, event for us, I would say. Absolutely. Let me also just add my thanks to everyone um, for your very incisive questions. And we look forward to hopefully continuing the debate in other contexts. And thanks to Yuri and Giovanni for coordinating this very complicated technical assemblage that enabled us to communicate so effectively. It's not a simple thing. And we really appreciate the work that you guys put into this to, um, to make it happen. So much obliged. Thank it was you. a real Thank pleasure. You. It was our pleasure indeed. And uh, to, to, to the, our participants, I need to say that uh, uh, the next uh, meeting is going to be on April 29. We are going to discuss with uh, three different authors, Alberta Andreotti, Patrick Legales, and uh, Javier Moreno Fuentes. And we're going to discuss about their article titled Globalized Minds, Rooting the City, Urban Upper Middle Classes in Europe. And uh, so, see you on the, 9th, uh, on the 29th. And uh, thanks again to Neil and uh, Christian. Thanks, everyone. Good night from Singapore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, we have still some sun here, but it's um, it's also already late afternoon. <laughs> okay. Also, thank you very much. Bye bye. Mm -hmm.